and well, yeah. it was also exciting to hear that Anna Tseng is going to be here. She's been part of our readings and discussions. Um, also, Hannah Landecker, um, she's a great mind, colorful mind. And we also had a workshop with her, basically trying to understand um, how all these substances from a post-industrial context are also creating a post-industrial metabolism. Uh, and that's how she defines it, basically how some of these microplastics or endocrine disruptors or different chemicals that are altering the body are actually almost part of our DNA. And that's creating a new human body, but also other um, non-human bodies. So yeah, those are the questions that we've been interested in. And I think for, for tonight, we thought about presenting a, a project more in detail, uh, looking also at this idea of toxicity circulating or flowing or floating around. And um, we'll be focusing on this project on the Isle of Skye in Scotland that we've been working, still are working on it for uh, a few more years. Yeah. ahead of us and and this is i think really an opportunity and to kind of open up many questions i think also about ways of practice about engagement i think for us it's something that we're thinking a lot about how these questions like what is the temporality of these questions and how do you develop platforms and infrastructure of practice that allow to really attain to some of these um complexities that many times cannot be addressed through a project or a exhibition, right? Or a presentation or a installation. So how it's really, I think, something that we've been doing for the past um, five years through this project to really kind of think about also not like only what is our practice, but what is the temporality of a practice. So yeah, really please, um, come up with any questions later. We're really happy to answer them and also continue at the bar. The waters of sky have been changing color. We know that seawater has no color, but different color reflections enter our eyes and sometimes we see blue. Sometimes we see gray or black. Other times we see brown or green. Yet in recent years, seawater has been dominated by different hues and multiple pantones. You are looking at Pantone 1555U. You are looking at Pantone 1565U. You are looking at Pantone 1625U. You are looking at Pantone 1635U. You are looking at Pantone 1575U. You are looking at Pantone 487U. You are looking at Pantone 486U. You are looking at Pantone 1645U. You are looking at Pantone 157U. You are looking at Pantone 1655U. You are looking at Pantone 158U. You are looking at Pantone 1665U. You are looking at Pantone 485U. You. are looking at the pantones of salmon. In Scotland, we heard of a house sparrow that had turned salmon. House sparrows can be found in most places where there are houses. As their name suggests, they are one of the most common birds in the world. Female and young birds have dark gray or brown feathers. While males have sometimes less dull bits around their neck. The sparrow we heard about in sky had turned salmon. It was believed to have eaten one of the feed pellets from a, farm, from a salmon farm. Like a flamingo eating shrimps, the sparrow also turned salmon. Salmon today would be gray, but salmon can also be red as pink or even salmon. In the water, the success of salmon, Scottish salmon as a branding, relies on coloring salmon fish into one of 15 salmon pantons. Farmed salmon relies on this synthetic coloring as they cannot feed on krill and shrimps that are otherwise found in the water. These crustaceans would give salmon flesh its salmon color, but in captivity they are replaced by artificial coloring substances. Astaxanthin is the substance responsible for salmon in krill deprived salmon. It is an antioxidant that protects salmon cells from environmental stress during their long migration. But salmon raised in farms are exposed to greater levels of captivity stress that disrupts the way in which color stays in the body. Salmon have to be fed astaxanthin artificially to allow salmon to metabolize salmon. But at the same time, this exposes how salmon are not able to metabolize their namesake. As the fish struggle to produce the ideal salmon tone customers expect in salmon. 90% of salmon swimming in the seas and shelved in supermarket aisles is a domesticated species. 
since the 1970s, salmon slowly ceased being an animal to become a profit equation. Selective breeding processes create fish which can grow much faster to market size than in any regular conditions in the wild. The definition of wild then in wild animals is something that was made through the violence of colonial settlement. It is when nature shows si signs of collapse that the distinction of wild and non-wild begins to appear. Wild salmon should be simply salmon, as wild was only invented as a label to refer to a system destroyed by humans that differentiates the wild and the domesticated species. There was not really such a thing as wild salmon. Every salmon was just wild. Domestication is what creates disorientation in relation to the environment. Rather than wild, it would be more accurate to say stream spawning uh, a salmon as many times hatcheries enhance the spawning of salmon by releasing juveniles from elsewhere out into the wild. When salmon began to be farmed in captivity in the 1960s, the understanding of the nuances between wild, enhanced and farmed river spawning and hatchery bread became even more necessary. Ecosystems are labeled as wild only when threatened by humans. Farmed salmon clearly differs from stream spawning salmon. It is fed with fish or pork based pellets, mixed with ground up chicken feathers and genetically modified yeast, all of which increases its levels of fat. It is colored artificially with pigments added to the feed to make its flesh acquire the ideal salmon tone. Its oedipus fins are clipped, disabling it from ever swimming properly outside the farm again. It is heavily dependent on antibiotics to fight disease and parasites like lethal sea lice that eats the fish alive. It is often has deformities in the skeleton manifesting in broken back syndrome, curvy back disease and short tails. Grown in close proximity in cylindrical open nets containing about one to two million fish per farm, farmed salmon has not only ma been made into a distorted body, it is also severely affecting both the body of the fish and the seabed. Hundreds of kilos of salmon manure sink through the open nets. Their excrements are deposited at the bottom of the sea, suffocating the entire ecosystem underneath and creating dead zones. Invisible suspended particles float away and give the water supplementary colors. These open nets function like toxic toilets like open water sewage, which is discharged onto the open seas by the tidal flow. One of these places we associate with salmon is Scotland, where salmon has been a food source for centuries. Since the 1980s, however, the appearance of a multitude of salmon farms all over the country have been dramatically changing the aquatic landscape. In 2016, a moratorium on fishing so-called wild salmon was passed in Scotland as their numbers were dramatically and still are dramatically dropping. Fishermen have been blamed for its disappearance, while the environmental impact caused by industrial aquaculture is not held accountable. On the Isle of Skye alone, 15 salmon farms are currently growing millions of fish per year. Recently, many salmon had to be sacrificed in Skye as not even strong antibiotics could keep the sea lice under control in such high concentration of fish. Hundreds of thousands of fish have been exterminated in order not to threaten the entire industry. Still, the industry does not acknowledge any connection between lice, infestations, and the high concentration of animals swimming in the same spot. Farming corporations claim that the parasite is simply a natural phenomenon. Instead of sacrificing fish, the industry has begun to try and kill off the sea lice with chemicals. Lice are becoming resistant to those antibiotics, so they get greater quantities have to be used, together with more toxic components that are frequently found in pesticides, herbicides, and some nerve agents. When chemicals do not work, optical devices have also been tried to target parasite by parasite in an underwater battlefield of light beams. Scottish salmon today does not entirely come from Scotland. 
Salmon hatching row is part of an intricate circulation of precious genes with eggs fertilized and incubated in different facilities and ready to be sent from farming site to farming site to farming site across the world. Therefore, Scottish salmon today, we could claim, is neither entirely Scottish nor is it salmon. An inventive marketing around the origins and quality of farmed salmon has emerged in the UK. The Scottish Salmon Company has branded themselves as purveyors of authentically Scottish salmon, despite being registered in Jersey, owned by a Swiss bank with Ukrainian and Norwegian investors, floated on the Oslo Stock Exchange and used imported Norwegian genetic material for their farmed salmon. Greek Seafood Hjotland sources salmon from the wild waters of Shetland. But wild here refers to the waters and not the fish itself. It is no surprise that Marks and Spencer's salmon brand name is Loch Muir. Indeed, a Scottish wilderness sounding name. But Loch Muir is a place that does not exist on the map. Aldi promotes best of Scotland salmon with an image of a fishing boat when it is actually farmed in Norway and the Faroe Islands. Morrison's promotes catch of the day salmon, which is sourced from farms in Norway, and Scottish quality salmon, which is farmed in Norway, but only smoked in Scotland. Scottish salmon has become a brand that needs to be critically rethought not only from an environmental and ecological perspective, but also questioning what Scottish and salmon mean in that construction. Farmed salmon is the result of the fish becoming a product of biocapital and biomass. It is a creature bred to be hungry, and its job is to put on weight. In order to quantify the salmon's success, the equation feed conversion ratio indicates the quantity of feed pellets around three kilos that equal in biomass gain around one kilo, and that three to one is the efficiency ratio with which feed pellets are converted into salmon flesh. The new feed pellet factory that has been built in Sky is meant to provide 55 jobs, undoubtedly an important and significant amount for a small island community. Yet it is still not entirely clear how many of those will serve the local population and how many, many will be long lasting positions. At the same time, the new plant legitimizes the environmentally damaging presence of open net salmon farms in the waters around the island to keep up with global demand. Salmon is the biggest selling seafood in the UK. But even if it's labeled as organic, there's a big disparity between the amount of organic labeled farms and the non-sufficient amount of so-called organic pellets available in the market. The desire for consumption of Scottish landscape is rendered through fish matter. Five out of six of the salmon conglomerates operating on the Isle of Skye depend on Norwegian-owned capital and consist of corporations that were legally obliged to monitor the salmon farming activity in Norway. Despite disguising their operations through branches in different countries, the 11 largest salmon farming corporations in the world still have their headquarters in Norway. Given that the Norwegian government has been introducing more environmental restrictions because of the detrimental effects of salmon farm, farming on Norwegian coastal waters, some of these companies have found fertile ground and waters in less restrictive countries, like Australia, Scotland, Ireland or Chile. Marine Harvest, recently renamed into Maui, is the largest salmon farming conglomerate in the world and also operates in Skye's seas. When the Scottish clearances happened some 200 years ago, thousands of Gael people were dispossessed, evicted from their villages and banned from living off the land as they used to. Today, salmon farming corporations are replicating a similar process by clearing the seabed. But as more, as more and more dead zones are appearing all around salmon farms across the world. This new wave of oceanic clearances is a multi-million uh, business for a few. Besides, the fact that the fish component of the pellets is made out of Peruvian anchovies, it is also leading to another form of um, colonization of the ocean, depleting resources for local fishermen in Peru in order to feed Norwegian and Scottish salmon in Europe. As ocean stocks depleted in Japan in the 1970s, Norway launched Project Japan, a governmental program to introduce farmed salmon abroad. 
Nigiri sushi was made with raw tuna and sea bream until then, while salmon was only consumed as a salted dried fish and did not have a great appeal to the population. After 15, 15 years of effort fighting the Japanese tuna lobby, the multi-million Norwegian campaign managed to, to persuade Japanese people to eat raw salmon, and by 1995, it became a common practice that boosted the demand for Norwegian farmed salmon. Salmon today is Japan's favorite sushi fish. Surrounded by the rugged landscape, indented coastline, and narrow lochs of sky, there are many ways which, in which market salmon performs nature. One of them is how salmon is bred beyond natural reproductive seasons. Year-round, consumer demand requires that the fish body is constantly fertile. Farms in northern latitudes deceive the fish and make them think that they are living in a different time of the year. For that purpose, a black roof dome is sometimes added on top of the open nets to distort their perception, as if they were in a different season. In winter periods of 24-hour darkness, artificial fluorescent lights are turned on and off. On and off. On and off. And on and off. 12-hour cycles simulating light conditions of spring, summer or autumn. Helped by artificial underwater heaters, this light regime triggers the reproductive season by deceiving their sense of orientation. Continuous light accelerates fish growth so that the farm can deliver salmon all year round. Their carefully engineered housing conditions have the power to advance or delay spawning time to produce eggs out of season. 12 hours of light. And 12 hours of darkness. Some years have two summers. And others just skip a winter. This accelerated growth has consequences for the fish, which among becoming insensitive and other physical deformities, it has also damaged their otoliths and made the fish become deaf. Paradoxically, the fact that farmed salmon cannot hear reduces its stress from inhabiting a very noisy machinery from a salmon farm. Another way to perform nature in a salmon farm is the, the creation of fake seaweed habitats as hiding spots for us. A fish being transplanted from southwest coast of England to Scotland to eat the lice that attack the salmon. Made with stripes of rubbish bags, these fake habitats allow rats to hide from the hundreds of thousands of salmon swimming around in the pen and eat their sea lice comfortably. To such an extent that ras, despite not being eaten by humans, have become one of the most sought after and expensive fish in the UK. Another disruption in the reproductive system is the way escapees are trapped between being a domesticated and a, and a wild species. Guided by a memory of the magnetic field or smell of a place, or even the sun, they orient their migration and with it they fulfill their sense of being. But bred in an onshore laboratory, farmed salmon lost that inherent sense of memory. It can no longer find its birthplace upstream and return there to spawn. It is disconnected from any natal river, or providing that it ever escapes, where does it go? Homeless and out loud, an escapee becomes an alien species in its original river. In Norway, escapees are listed as a threat to the so-called wild salmon population. If they mix with their counterparts outside of the farm, the new fish will be part of that disrupted system. Only a few months ago, 21,000 salmon fish escaped from a farm in Skye. This raises the question of where does an escapee return to, or how can it find its way back upstream? If a farmed salmon tries to swim to its natal place to spawn, it sometimes goes back to the hatchery that created a magnetic or olfactory imprint in its brain. Farmed salmon is only recently becoming an animal and less a product, with more studies and regulations trying to understand its feelings, its memory and its sense of orientation. The question still remains what is a domesticated, a cultivated or tamed salmon? Is farmed salmon an industrial aquaculture success or an environmental catastrophe? From the local habitat to the global market, <coughs> the scales at which salmon performs are yet to be decultured. 
After decades of overfishing and exhaustive salmon farming, Sky's waters have reached a point where seasonal productivity, ecology, and employment need to be rethought. Food seasons as we know them have ceased to exist. In a supermarket, you can find strawberries, tomatoes, plums, or even salmon all year round. You have all seasons. Beyond this flattened, continuous, 365-day-long seasons, what would be the new periods we could eat according to today? If humans have been changing environments, how can we also change our food systems to adapt to them and build other forms of landscape? Climavore explores how to eat as humans change climate. It is a form of devouring that follows the anthropogenic consequences of landscapes affected by intensive forms of extraction. Different from carnivore, omnivore, locavore, vegetarian or vegan diets, it is not so much the ingredients that define climavore, but rather the infrastructural responses to human-induced climatic events. New seasons of food production and consumption have begun to appear. Dry seasons are sometimes more arid and sometimes less. Rainy seasons are becoming longer, but sometimes shorter. The number of frost-free nights has increased in some places, but decreased in others. These non-absolute cycles are discontinuous, disjointed, disconnected, and non-sequentially repetitive. <coughs> but do dropping water levels justify digging deeper wells to exhaust even deeper aquifers? Or could we acclimatize our existence to flexible patterns beyond intensive water consumption? Denuding imaginaries, landscapes, and infrastructures reveal a new set of clues for adapting our diet, anxieties, and desires to them. Climavore aims to rethink the environmental futures of coastal inhabitation and the coastal commons through a diet that can effectively transform desires and infrastructure. In the case of polluted shores by salmon farms, it takes the tidal zone as an ambiguous site that appears, disappears, reappears, and constantly changes in size. Coastal space has no clear definition and opens up for murky, yet cleaner forms of usership, and can become today the entrance into a new ecology, economy, and imaginary. Other understanding of aquacultures in sky and its tidal zones can become a site of opportunity for more sensitive practices. Human-induced climatic alterations of the waters, ranging from increasing acidification of the ocean, appearance of new parasites, and disappearance of species, could be approached through other forms of eating and sourcing of nutrients. Different from intensive salmon farming that produces an excess of nitrogen, other creatures do opposite processes. They clean the water by breathing. So do other filter feeder bivalves like clams, scallops, racer clams, barnacles, and also seaweeds like kelp, sea lettuce, or dolls. They all provide an incredible source of protein um, without any need for feed or fertilizers. Despite having lost connection today to some of these ingredients, they were abundant and used by both humans and animals. There are archaeological remains of prehistoric sheep in Scotland with marks in their teeth that indicate a kelp-based diet. And even in modern times, a booming industry in Skye emerged for kelp-based explosive during the Napoleonic Wars in the 1820s. Kelp was used to farm improve poor soils for millennia. In places like Jersey, in the Channel Islands, the use of seaweed collected from the ocean as fertilizer had been a common practice with laws explicitly regulating citizens' rights and optimal seasons for its gathering. Certain varieties, like kelp or bladderwreck, had abounded quantities of minerals that once laid on the fields would slowly be released and accelerate the growth of vegetables and tubers. Crofters have used the tidal zone not only for fish traps, where all sorts of fish would be caught by the low tide, but also to forage dust and eat it raw or boiled in soup. Over centuries, food sourcing from the tidal zone enabled social structures where women were the strength of fishing economies, from sorting oysters on the beach, lifting the catch, to carrying their husbands to shore. Oysters have also been cheap sources of protein, in the east coast of the US, oyster traders had hybrid house barges from where they would moor in different piers to sell their stock to wholesale suppliers. 
their mobile barges were a hybrid between fishing, a fishing facility, a shop, an impromptu eatery, and a home altogether. After sourcing oysters from naturally occurring beds, it was later discovered that they could be grown in oyster tables. Structures going hundreds of meters into the sea where oysters are washed by the tides following moon cycles. On the Isle of Skye, our oyster table functions as a dining table and opens the discussion for other aquacultures that could happen. Every day at high tide, the structure allows its 1,000 oysters, mussels, and seaweeds to breathe, while each one filters up to 120 litres of seawater per day. At low tide, the oyster table emerges above the sea and functions as a dining table, where we placed some humans. Over breakfast, lunch, or dinner, according to the tides, performative meals features a series of climbable ingredients where workshops with fishermen, politicians, residents, and scientists have been held to discuss other cultural imaginary for the island. Guests enjoyed blindly oyster cocktails, crunchy shingles, or lasagna, for sure, among many other climbable delights. Aiming to divest away from salmon farming and develop alternative aquacultures, a network of restaurants was also established. Each replaced farm salmon with a climbable dish. And we had a food truck, a local bakery, a pie shop, a bar, a hotel, or a Michelin star restaurant that served Climavor doll soup, coca kelp Climavor ice cream, Climavor kelp whiskey, twice dived Climavor scallops, or home um, rope grown mussel nibbles. The ongoing project is expanding into a new permanent installation, the Climavor station in Portree to secure traineeships and placements for local teenagers from the professional cooking school. Through pedagogical and professional development, the future cooks of the island can start introducing that new coastal imaginary. The tidal zone is a space of opportunity for discussing the spatial constructions of the ocean and its shores, to rethink coastal policy and facilitate small-scale independent initiatives. The Climavore Station will also provide legal advice and consultancy on how to open your own oyster or seaweed farm while supporting how to object planning applications that are trying to open and expand salmon farms in Scotland, and all of these while serving delicious club of our dishes. Slowly, people coming up the sky would ask for sky kelp, sky dulls, sky oysters, or sky mussels, ingredients that regenerate the coast by breathing in this era of increasingly evident man-induced climatic events. On the tidal zone, we can determine what we eat as humans are changing climate. We'll leave it here. Yeah. If you have any questions or complaints. Digested a little bit as well. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> I like the way that um, everything is sort of adapting to climatic conditions, and we need to use any, I guess, um, the changes in climates and seasons. Uh, but my question is a bit more on, I mean, the greater system of how we are changing our climate. Mm -hmm. um, how do you address, for instance, the, um, the Isle of Skye when tides move far in indefinitely or mm -hmm. far out indefinitely where that particular site isn't, I guess, in the same conditions that it is now where we have the liberty of um, adapting to the climatic changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What happens in, I guess, 10 years? Mm -hmm. Um, so, well, I think there are many ways to look at it, but I think one thing which feels very apt these days that like geologically what is happening at the moment within the UK is that England is sinking and Scotland is rising, um, literally, um, and therefore kind of Scotland as a whole is not so much prone, let's say, to flooding. So like the question of kind of 
um, sea level rise is something that is like less, let's say, is less going to affect um, sky and kind of the areas surrounding it. But yes, I think one of the things that the project is looking at is exactly the fact that the co the tidal zone is has been always in flux and communities have like for hundreds of years learned how to adapt with it and and many like in many ways the origins of like not adapting with it are like actually emerged from here right like from the netherlands the idea that you can fortify the coast and not kind of live with like a shifting coastline and this is for us where kind of these practices are very interesting because they're like bringing back the connection into the space that is in flux. And it's again like how do you articulate systems and infrastructure or kind of lay infrastructures that allow basically people to move together with the tides and with the tides and where like one positions itself. So in many, like in the very immediate way, I don't think that like sea level rise or kind of the the shoreline is like a real threat to like anywhere in the sky yet still the project is tries to come like at it from a bit of a different kind of space or like how do you open up the space of the tidal zone and especially because it's also legally a very murky space right it it shifts every day twice between land and sea and that kind of because of that, it allows for like different things to happen at different times of the day. And I think, we're, we're, uh, in a, in a way, what climatic the new <coughs> human-induced climatic events, what they are in a way allowing people to think about, is that maybe we need more adaptable adaptable uh, frameworks. Because even if the sea would rise, like what would be the problem? You, like in a like old way, you would just move further up, or you would shift from maybe eating brown seaweeds to red seaweeds or, or like because each one has a different depth so you would just like eat the ones that are more accessible the problem is when if these events happen that what they threaten most of the times is kind of an enclosed property structures uh, and then if the soil becomes too brackish uh, or, or the wetlands becomes too brackish then it is into a, a different kind of system of circulating value but if we would were to think of a whole new framework that needs to be more adaptable to climatic events, like property would also need to be adapting accordingly. And that's, for instance, in, in East Anglia, we've been working on another project there, and that's interesting that then they introduced the rollback register um, for places in, in Norfolk and, and Suffolk that are eroding, and the cliffs are eating up uh, all the land that people were not supposed to be inhabiting, because like in ancient times, you would know that every 500 years, possibly, uh, that would erode and that there would be accretion again and then erosion again. So these cycles, they are much more kind of geological time, um, would allow you to, or to help you also move with the tides accordingly. Uh, so I think that capacity that in a way has been lost because of like yeah, property structures and ways in which value circulates, those maybe might need to start enlightening other forms of uh, jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Does the state just assign you a slot? Well, this, uh, yeah, yeah. It's a very good question. Yeah. We, we learned a lot. So at the beginning, we wanted to put the structure of the title zone, and like no one agreed, and who had the authority to approve it. Um, so every time we spoke to a different person there, like different opinions. Uh, because what is clear is that until the edge of the water is like a conventional property owner, uh, and from the low tide mark to the open seas is uh, the crown state. The intertidal zone, not clear. Um, some people were saying it's the crown state, the queen ultimately, or the government on her behalf. Um, but then also the harbor master seemed to be playing a big role. Um, so it was ultimately the authori authorization was on the one hand from the harbor master that allowed it because he thought it was not dangerous for boats um, anchoring nearby. And because also it was supposed to be like- Temporary. Temporary. Um, was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that was part of the, the interesting thing is like like you cannot put anything permanent. It's like perfect, it's not permanent. And it's like so okay, so you get two years um permission and then 
we'll see. It's like, perfect. And then like it's kind of negotiated on a much more kind of yearly basis uh, because it's not a threat for anyone. Uh, and that was, I think, also more interesting for the project that that would be on a rolling basis somehow. And the other, on the other hand, we also had to uh, get a new job, which was a new certificate to become non-commercial oyster farmers. That's our new title for the Scottish government. And, and that was also another interesting thing to think about. Uh, what does it mean to have a non-commercial farm, which doesn't make any sense. It's like an oxymoron. Uh, but it was also exciting. Like, this is like a farm to almost to lose money um, because we are not interested in harvesting uh, oysters or seaweeds for selling it ourselves. Oh. Uh, but we're interested in facilitating the discussion through that non-commercial farm uh, for other people to try to like make it happen. So salmon, like salmon farms, have to apply for. So salmon are deeper, like in the water, and they have to get the license. They're permanent and commercial, and and they have to get the license from the crown, and that's a very like long and complicated process where you have to apply for planning permission basically and there's a whole kind of um, process where people can object and people do object always but then like salmon farms have like because they're like multi-billion kind of corporations they have like huge lobbyists that work for them that basically manage even when like plans are objected to kind of overturn these decisions like within the Scottish government. So, it's, and again, it's kind of the unevenness basically of like the political terrain and the, the, like the aquatic terrain really gets exposed to the process. And this is exactly kind of as the, the project now progresses is a lot of these discussions that we're trying to facilitate. So we've been doing a lot of studies in the past year of objection like letters and complaints from like residents all across Scotland just trying to understand like what are what are kind of objection letters that get heard or in which cases like farms were stopped and in which like in which cases weren't right because it, like with any planning kind of objection you have to have like a very very kind of well rehearsed argument right that really knows like all the details of what happens and it's something that like most like residents wouldn't necessarily have the language to kind of in the knowledge to or kind the of, time or the time to kind of really delve into these topics so it's like how again like the project kind of allow to facilitate this kind of knowledge and how it it could create for instance various templates that would be kind of people would just like be able to feed information into and they like, get through that like a letter right that would kind of is more likely to kind of stop or delay like a development of a salmon farm so we, we were looking into all these like hundreds of letters that are public you can just like go one by one uh we are aiming to do it with machine learning uh at the moment we're doing it manually uh and you have like incredible letters from people saying like salmon farm is ugly i don't want it in front of my house not valid that's an argument or like we, there's even like one children's uh like a, a drawing. drawing of like a salmon farm like with like like evil creatures like also not valid as an argument for the objection um so they're basically tracing the ones that have been approved and the ones that have been rejected and also talking to residents there that have been fighting for years uh, like all these kind of farms and especially there's a few people that have been very very vocal and and also in terms of background is people that have been working in finance like hardcore like like finance and they uh, re retired on the island some years ago and they were telling us they took them two years to learn the jargon of how to do it because they did not want a salmon farm in front of their house and like after learning, 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 learning themselves, and they had the time also because they were retired, but it took them two years, uh, and then they eventually managed, I think three times, to stop a salmon farm in front of their house. Three consecutive times, applications. But imagine like if you like have to go to work every day, where do you find the time or the knowledge to, to gather and, and kind of make a valid um, objection letter? So that's a... Very contest. It's like with buildings. The same, like in London, is very common. Like I don't know here, maybe probably the same. Yes. That with every application, there's kind of you're allowed to send comments. Yeah. 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 Um, 
So the same with salmon farms, yeah. the same process. You have a question? Yeah, I, mean, um, <coughs> I, really, I really like the presentation. Thank you. Uh, that was, well, I think the first thing is like how you, uh, you turn it into a visual essay, that, that, that like formative piece, and, and you bring all this uh, invisible uh, or the invisibility of the industry, you, you, you surface it and you have to the public. And, it's, uh, and how you use the performance mm -hmm. or the lecture as an exhibition format. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also for the larger mm -hmm. as you said in the beginning. Mm -hmm. so, I would be interested to also to hear more about that. Mm -hmm. And then just the second thing, I think, which I think relates to your question, uh, I see, I mean, economy is all around in your, in your uh, I don't know how to call it now, reflector <laughs> like or piece. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was just wondering, like, you yourselves, uh, you say you, you're, you're now a non-profit uh, farmer, right? Uh, but how do you support a project like that? How is the economical aspect of your personal, uh, yeah, how do you position yourselves in that economy? Mm -hmm. Yeah, in great questions. Mm -hmm. um, so, well, I think first kind of in terms of like, in a way, question around formats and how kind of different, like how the project lives in different kind of spaces. So the project started in 2016. We were invited by an, like an arts institution on the island called Atlas Arts, which I think really, this invitation really changed in some way or shifted the way we practice because basically Atlas does not have a venue and they use the whole island as a venue. And when we were invited up there, we were like, they were like, this is the island. And welcome. like, welcome. And they took us, like, we were there for 10 days and they just took us around and like, we met a lot of people and had interviews and like, went to look at the archives and et cetera, et cetera. And then they said, you know, the project can happen like everywhere. We did a project on a cliff on the top of a mountain where people were singing. We did a performance like on the beach. Atlas, we did, yeah. yeah. And in kind of, and from there, and we, since we really kind of, are interested, or the way we approach kind of landscapes is through looking at food infrastructures. And that's kind of our point of entry to understand all of these questions around culture and economy. We kind of salmon there became kind of something that was very evident as, as and that can really portray the whole transformation of the landscape over the past like hundreds and like <laughs> thousands of years till today and into the future. And, and that's kind of, and, from that kind of we became the first iteration with the oyster table. But I think research is something that is like very important in our practice. And then it's always a question, how is that rendered in different spaces and how kind of we can carry it, right? And how can we bring, part, since kind of salmon is such a global phenomenon that is kind of and especially has become something that we all eat. Like 10, 15 years ago, it would have been like a type of food that you would eat in special occasions, like at Christmas, right? And like celebrations, birthdays. And today it's like in any like pret a manger, like cafe, Nero cafe. I mean, it's like in every kind of well, let's say food kind of stuff. And even like small supermarkets, you know, you would find like your salmon sandwich. And this transformation is as all to do with like the industrialization of salmon. So how do you, so on the one hand you have like a very local question, but yet at the same time, it's like an extremely global question. And for us, it's like how all the time you bring these two spaces together and how do we kind of jump between these scales? So I think for us, like the performative lecture is like one way to do it. And when we're like speaking in a more kind of global context and in Sky, it's very localized with the oyster table. And then now we're working on an exhibition. We were invited to do an exhibition in London that will be in May. And it's 
that's kind of we're developing a whole new format, right? And like re completely rethinking the whole project of like what does it mean for it to exist within a cultural institution and what does it mean for it to kind of also live within the gallery? And it's, and when in our practice we're like, I think we're not interested in kind of showing the documentation of something, but like really how you carve kind of the way it kind of operates within the different space and creates like a channel to communicate these questions and influence these infrastructures wherever this kind of is happening. And the second question, the economics, um, is, is something that we think a lot about and I think it's kind of a chicken and egg because the one thing leads to the next and then the other to the next and it helps us think on the uh, on the one hand how to fund the project along the way, but also what is the shape of the project according to that. And they're completely entangled. Um, so it started as a commission by Atlas Arts uh, in 2016 with the intention of it lasting like usually it's like the like a few months. Well, so you for, for, I mean, you do a, you know, a project that would be like this ten day. You know, you would put the. I mean, the beginning was like you put the oyster table like ten and then, days, and, and then, then like we'll see. And then yeah, we'll see. It's like, well, why don't we leave it? Why don't we expand it? And then because it attracted a lot of attention, we wanted to make it last in different forms. So the obvious, most immediate one was to leave the structure that doesn't cost much. Is every now and then maintenance a bit. Um, but then we also soon realized that, um, for instance, the restaurants that were a key part of the project needed also uh, climb up our cooks. So that's why we expanded to the school and started linking it to pedagogy uh, because we needed a next generation of, of, of teenagers that wanted to become professional cooks on the island that would deal with questions around the coast. So then we started the workshops with the 15, 16, 17 years old. Uh, and then for that, for instance, something that is very fundable, let's say, by organizations in terms of like rural development or Scottish government. So there's a lot of like grants and that, that can come for that more pedagogical aspect uh, or, or foundations or philanthropists. So there's different parts of the project from, uh, from the more kind of, you could call it sculptural to the more kind of uh, pedagogical or training or yeah, different bits and pieces and as, as these bits and pieces are created and other people join in. Or for instance, the, with the legal consultancy uh, to provide advice on how, either how to open your own small seaweed farm or to object planning applications. So now we're working with environmental lawyers to provide advice uh, pro bono. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but that's what makes it exciting in a way for us. And that's also, we are now kind of in a loop that is growing. Uh, and then with, now with the climate war station, we are trying to repurpose a ruin there uh, in, in Sky, and that's kind of another layer because that's a heritage listed building. Um, and then for that, there's again another kind of grants and pockets of money that you can apply for because it's cultural heritage, but we are proposing to make it into environmental heritage as well. And that's something that not, or like no one has done before apparently in, in their grant scheme. So they were very excited like, okay, how do we make this kind of prototype? of bringing together the architectural, cultural, and environmental heritage into one building that can live outside the building as well. And so, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a bit of a puzzle. Uh, and, and in that sense, I mean, I think the main question here is like how we do, inf like I think for us the question is like how each and every aspects of their projects are infrastructure, so we don't think about it as like, this is like, Install, like the installation part that kind of and this is like the public program part and this is the education part and this is kind of the administrative or the legal right it's like all of these like they can you can think about all of them as like tapping in and kind of changing infrastructure and and I think the moment and I think this is something that like really changed with our practice like around this project and since then we've been like really, really trying to push it like as far as we can and it like really opened it up our practice to very like just very like to sources of funding that like unexpected. like unexpected and like that I wouldn't you know, when we started doing like when we started practicing I would never think, you know, that we would get like all of these kind of rural development grants and stuff like that because it's like it's 
an artistic project, right? But it's like it really kind of deals with like questions around education and connecting people to the coast and like all of these things that suddenly there's like and then there's like in like in every there's always like funding for thing right we always complain that like the the funding for culture is being cut but still there's like there is funding around to do things so it's like it's always the question like how do you tap into yeah. these like sources of funding and now we're even like being invited to apply for grants that like how do we fit and people like reach out to us like you should apply for that Okay. Now we like we were asked to apply for this like social enterprise like for these kind of social enterprise kind of startups, you know, and you're like and it's right. kind of this competition that you have to pitch your startup for like but it's like well yeah, like I mean I don't see him myself as like a startupist, but like at the same time it's like maybe like we could like perform this role, right? And they get 150,000 pounds for that. It's like, not a bad deal, right? Like, I can do the performance. Like, it's a much better fee than they would get for like any performance in like any cultural institution. So it's like, I think these are exactly constantly, like how do we kind of shift the practice for that? Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. But I'm particularly curious to uh, tell your answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think, definitely. Yeah. I think it's the, the law for us is an incredible field of practice. We know very little, but we try to learn along the way and collaborate with people who really know about it. Um, the two projects that you mentioned, uh, they're in a way connected and had to do a lot with thinking about the legacy of an installation in a more kind of, a, let's say, exhibition space. Um, and we, because we do a lot of research and, and collect a lot of artifacts or stories or different episodes that might manifest in, in that exhibition as a as an archive, let's say, then we always try to think what 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 happens with that. In the case of New York was with these ways of appreciating trees or how trees have been used to displace people or how people have been using trees to stay in place, uh, both in yeah, multiple histories of dispossession, etc. Green gentrification. But there it was very important to for us to think of a, a legacy for the city of New York trying to change the legislation or make a public amendment to the current law of the city. And that's where we collaborated with uh, CELDF, uh, Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund. They're based in Washington and they've been involved in granting rights to Lake Erie as a non-human being, but also with the government of Ecuador uh, to write the rights of the Pachamama into the constitution of the country. And they were very keen and collaborating on this piece that we proposed it to be a legal amendment to grant trees, the trees of the city of New York, the right not to serve as carbon offsets, um, which is a whole process that has been happening since the financial crash. Um, so how to leave that piece of legislation? And of course, it didn't pass, but it was like kind of a, an amendment to be proposed uh, as kind of a future um, legacy yeah. and something similar in Kiev but with the rights of the soil not to be exhausted by overuse of fertilizers and, and I think in that sense for us it's like it's always everyone is like or corporations or companies right are trying always to abuse the law as much as they can they're trying to kind of get away um, with kind of with the thresholds of what is allowed and and I think for us, it's always the question. I think it's something we talk a lot with our students as well. Like how how do we use that space as a productive space as well? Because the law, in the same way that you can abuse the law, you can also use the law in order to like put things in place that could create like better environments and better spaces and better architecture or better design or better institutions, whatever. So it's and it's like always. So I think we think a lot about this idea of the loophole. 
right? Like, how do you find the, the space, the, like the dark, the blind spots in the law where you could intervene in? Or how do you create, find the spaces where, like, you could do something that would kind of, sh like, make a small shift that kind of, again, would create, like, a whole different landscape or infrastructure? And I think this is something, like, from the project in the sky, that this is why we got, ex like, so excited about the the tidal zone, right? Because for us, it's kind of it's a space that shifts constantly between the two, like between land and sea. So it kind of it just becomes like it's a gray. It's literally a gray zone, right? So and that allows for all kinds of things to happen there that you couldn't good and bad, good good and bad. bad but like that could ha couldn't happen like in the sea and couldn't happen on the land. And like we always try to find, I guess, these kind of Liter like literally find these spaces, and then once we've identified them, we are like, okay, what? So, what's going to happen here? What can we do, and how can we start like using that in order to kind of create a different environment? And then you're putting at the architecture department. What do you teach your students? Ask them. Yeah, what have you learned? It's a whole package. It's a whole package. Yeah. I mean, I think in a way, I think we, it's exactly the, all these questions that you've been asking. It's on the one hand, how, like, how do we identify space of, of intervention? Like, what is an intervention today? What are the borders of, of in which kind of things are circulating? And from there, like, what tools do we have in order to intervene? And today, like, is an intervention a building? Or is it an infrastructure? Or it's, is it a set of tools that one is designing? And, and then from there, which we haven't reached to, but I think in a way, like, also being here today opens the question of, like, how do you set up a practice? Because I think no one, like, when we were in school, like, no one taught us, like, how this can be done and like which spaces exist in which you can start asking these questions and carve like the time and the space and the resources to do it and we did like a lot of trials and errors and we're also like lucky I guess in like a few attempts and like things started rolling but I think there's like it's a real question like how do you like how do you bring yourself from a point that you're like applying for like cultural funding, right, to do like a project or like to go on a residency in order to like be able to shift a place that you're applying for like a rural like education, like a grant that supports like education in like rural communities. And like it's like really, I think we really try to question like the sp this like disciplinary space as well and kind of how to give students tools um, to go out and kind of start asking these questions themselves because yeah i think we need many more i think we need more many more colleagues kind of working in these ways like with us because it's i think there's like very urgent questions around this today and there's a lot of work like to be done and and i think it's interesting also to teach in an architecture department in a way um because architecture has been like throughout the whole kind of modernity in the 20th century, how to make a building that is, has this perfect, perfect environmental performance. And, and then how can we, for us, what is interesting is how do you rethink that environmental performance? What does that mean today? And how do you think the building, not as a building, but as a, as a built environment, including the building or what has been considered the building until now or until the kind of, yeah, uh, the pro pro project of modernity? Uh, and how do you think of it as an inseparable from larger body of ecology, ecologies. Um, and that's kind of the built environment. And if you start considering all these actors, stakeholders, multiple time scales, um, timelines, geological time, like the building is kind of almost irrelevant within that. Not necessarily relevant, but it's another thing within that kind of interconnected chain of actions and events. Um, so to have that expanded kind of idea of what architecture or the role of architecture in all of those kind of multiple disciplines, um, I think for us it's more yeah, an approach to the world that can allow for different forms of practice. But also you bring it back to art practice uh, in, in, in terms of performance mm -hmm. and the mix of performances, mm -hmm. the lecture performance, the reading, mm -hmm. how do you, how do you, from that, how do you work with the students or how do you mm -hmm. yeah. uh, 
prepare people this is a wide range of things mm -hmm. from yeah. organizational skills to mm -hmm. almost curating to yeah. mm -hmm. managing to mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, I think there's like they they have to deal with many things, <laughs> and they ha well, and I think also the and challenge. It's a struggle. It's also a struggle for, for us. us. Yeah, like and, and I think, but I think it's like it's also, and I think the biggest challenge is also that always the topics that we're dealing, and I think it's also true probably to everyone sitting in the room, like the questions that we're asking today are extremely complicated, right? So it's like also the things that we're dealing with is not just like. It's not like it's like it's not like like from a modern architecture perspective when you have like the way the measure you know like the, the measurements are these and these and these and this and like and if you have this problem you respond with this and that no we're like living in a time where like the conditions are unfolding like under our feet as we're like taking steps and and how do we like develop the response to that also has to become it's very has to become like emerge out of like the practice itself. So in a way, I think we by showing examples, by like giving tools, by giving a lot of I think emphasis on like the present, like what is a presentation. Like we have uh, this practice that we rehearse every time before there are crits. Like we 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 do rehearsals, right? Like which is just to get this kind of put the body in and kind of the voice in the space that this is kind of it's a perform like it's a performance right and that you know what you're saying and it's not just like I've done all of this work in the studio and here it's on the wall and now like I tell I, the work will speak for itself because I think it's like the work needs to be speak like needs to speak for itself but at the same time like a lot of it needs to be narrated because I think one of the question for us is like with each audience that we would go to, the story that we present is different, right? And like the the story is complex enough that it could be read us in many different ways. So when we speak, we had a meeting like two weeks ago with the Minister of um, the Environment and Rural Affairs in the Scottish government. And she got this presentation, but she a got like different. a bit different, right? And like the word salmon was mentioned only three times in the presentation and not like 37 times, but it was there, right? Because like we had to bring her, we didn't want to create like antagonism from the first moment, but like bring her into a space that she's like really excited about it because if she writes like a recommendation letter now, we have like a much greater chance to get like a heritage lottery fund for like half a million pounds, right? Which would allow us to do like incredible. So it's like always how you're like planting these seeds in these different spaces and knowing how to read kind of the political sphere around you and kind of responding to that. And I think this is like, I hope what we are, doing with the students as well. And, and another thing is also that it's something we really enjoy, maybe, that what just happens to, for it to be, that to focus on something very, very particular or an anecdote or a substance, like the, the exercise of this year. Um, and then from there, it start unpacking like all these kind of things. So for instance, with the sparrow that turned salmon, for us was like really captivating because it sounds so silly and mad and sick and everything together. And how do you start um, like tracing? Like, why did the bird turn pink? What did they eat? Like, why is it connected to the salmon farm? What happened with the salmon farm? Yeah. Yeah, and, and now that's what's that was become, the, salmon, yeah. the, the sparrow was mentioned, I think, the first day or second interview we had in 2016 in Sky. And like, it, it, stuck to, it sticks to your head. And it's like, but how is this possible? And the more you try to understand all those global forces and multiple scales and how this toxicity is traveling, the more you enter into complexity, the more questions you get, like the fewer answers that you are also generating. And now when we're doing this exhibition in May, right, like basically the whole exhibition is about the, spa like about the sparrow, right? So it's kind of where like really, unp I mean, going, we've been in the past year going like deep, deep, deep into like color and kind of various color theories and how basically color, like, Climate change is not only changing the weather, but it's like literally changing how we see like everything around us, right? So how like animals are changing, like different landscapes are ch like the color is changing. So and that is kind of yeah, allowing us to take like a whole new kind of route into the project. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, we can Said go. Bye. Okay. Thank, thank you. you.